I now have a distinct pleasure of introducing, um, I guess you could say, a lifetime hero of mine, um, someone who I grew up with, and he must be tired of hearing that from everybody of a certain age. Um, but certainly, uh, he needs no introduction, but let me just say he is the co-founder of Imagine Entertainment and an Academy Award-winning filmmaker, Ron Howard. Ron, welcome to Signal. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for that, uh, for that introduction. You know, thanks to reruns, there are a lot of generations now that feel like they've grown up uh, with me, and, and uh, uh, I never get tired of hearing it. It's, it's, it's unique. Uh, I'm grateful yeah. for it, and, uh, and, I, and I love the, the wide array of conversations I wind up having. Uh, uh, you know, I look back, I look forward to getting, being able to be out wandering the streets again and having those chats with people. Exactly. Um, yeah, you have to know that one of my goals here is to get Opie to swear. If I can do that, then I can hang it up as an interlocutor. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it happens now, on the set a lot. I'm going to admit, when I'm directing, uh, it can get a little salty. But uh, generally, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much under control. It, that's good to know. It's good to know because I think that you, you know, you've been sort of this, uh, you know, this lodestone of of, uh, of American wholesomeness, starting, you know, with the Andy Griffith Show. Through, I mean, you you had so many guest roles when I was a child. I would say, "Oh, there he is again! There he is again! There he is again!" And then, you know, going into into Happy Days, which was so iconic, and that cast, my God, what an incredible cast and crew uh, on that show! Um, but now you're working Great with fucking cast. Great fucking cast. Oh, jeez, oh, you got it already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it. <laughs> I made it I'm easy done. for you. <laughs> um, but now you're working. I mean, I, I, I'm really interested in this new project that I'm aware of uh, uh, only, you know, through my research in, 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 in with P&G. And, and, and one of the reasons you're here is that you are uh, Imagine Entertainment has a partnership with P&G. Uh, and, and you just announced uh, your first uh, film that you're making coming out later next year. Can you tell us about uh, Mars 2080? Absolutely. Well, yes. I mean, we're really excited about this partnership. I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, you know, I had, I had opportunities to meet with Mark and it's very inspiring. And I'd love to drill down on kind of where Imagine aligns with a company like P&G. But, uh, but Mars is a, is, a, is, a, is a great first project. You know, we did two seasons of a very ambitious show that I was very proud of on, on Nat Geo about about going to Mars. Could man get there? Could they establish a, a station? It was it was really thrilling. It was, you know, sort of part documentary and part scripted, very experimental and fascinating. But <clears throat> we also learned a great deal um, and about, you know, what it would take to actually sustain life there. Could 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 there be a settlement? What would that require? What would it be like? And uh um, and, you know, in, in, in meeting with Mark and talking, uh, you know, to our new partners um, at, at P&G, of course, we discovered that, um, you know, they're all that P&G is developing all kinds of sustainable tech to help curb climate change. But it's also the tech that would be required to sustain life on another planet, a planet like Mars. So that kicked off a conversation which began to scratch a creative itch that Brian and I and and uh, you know and our team at Imagine continued to to, uh, to 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 have which is you know we think there's a great story there uh, uh, you know a story about a family um, basically immigrating and 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 you know and what would that be so this is this is all fiction but it's going to be very fact based we're going to make a feature film out of it for theatrical uh, distribution and uh, uh, you know big kind of big screen um, cinematic experience for people. And it's a great creative opportunity for us and uh, works well for, for P&G. And, and I think we're off to a great start uh, getting to cut our teeth on this project. Yeah, well, and the announcement just came out uh, yesterday. So maybe we'll post a link into the Hopin platform for everyone if they want to learn more about that. But since I have you, I have a chance to ask you a few questions more broadly about your work, about you know, Hollywood and about the industry and the business you're in. And I know you take a lot of interest in both the business, the audience, you know, so let's get into it. Um, first of all, I'm curious, 
you know, we just heard from Mark uh, Pritchard about the change in his business and in, in, in his industry uh, that the turbulence of the past four months has had on, you know, on, on, on in the world that he lives in. How has it impacted Hollywood and the, and the film business, both the social justice movement as well as the pandemic? Well, I, I, the um, you know the, the social justice movement is is a reminder and a and a wake up call uh, for for all of us. I, I, I'd imagine uh, you know if you look at our lineup of projects over the years, you know I think Brian Grazer and I have always been interested in stories about people uh, you know from every corner of the of the planet and all walks of life and types and colors and genders and so forth. But it, it's still a reminder that we can do better and uh, and and we must. And um, and and it's, uh, you know, and I'm 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 hoping as 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 a guy who, um, you know, I'm not I'm very optimistic. Um, I'm 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 a proud American. I want to believe that we can take as a country the lead in that. And, and of course, storytellers. Um, sort of have to pick up that standard and run with it because it's, uh, um, you know, we all learn through narrative. We all learn through stories. And when Mark talks about the idea of being constructive through the stories that they tell about the brands and being creative, um, you know, well, we, we, we had imagined Brian and I, we try to do the same thing. We always, we always have, we always have that discussion about a project, you know, why, are, why are we making it? Well, because it's funny and it's, It'll be a great vehicle for a cast member and audiences will like it. Yeah, but why are we making it? What what are we saying? And, uh, you know, and when when so I, I think that uh, uh, when we answer those questions, we feel better and better about our project. And that's when we really um, throw ourselves uh, into it. So, uh, again, with p and I think that conversation, well, we were just so like minded that it was uh, it was really inspiring. And and we have found in recent years, as Imagine has a little more flexibility in its business plan, that's a whole other story. But right now we're in a position to be able to follow different storytelling paths than we've and more than we've ever been before. And so this association makes sense because we discovered you know, fairly recently, as we began to exercise our independence, that that you know, brand thematics, and um, and and particularly ambitious ones that are aligned with with uh, you know with with uh, very constructive thinking uh, about what customers really need and where products can interface with that. That can actually that stimulates creativity uh right. and and the possibility for new narratives and new stories so for 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 a company like ours for Brian and I specifically but also all of the people who work with us and our, our collaborators and other writers and directors and so forth kicking those kinds of ideas around often yields something exciting like hey here's a here's a real reason to make this mars project you know right right now for the past 4 months no one's gone to the movies or, or if they have they've been a bit sorry that they have that's not good necessarily for for the filmed entertainment business. On the other hand, uh, you know, OTT streaming is going through the roof. Uh, you're yeah. releasing your first uh, directorial debut on streamer uh, later uh, this year, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which we'll talk about in a minute. I'm curious your view on, do you think that these consumer shifts in behavior are going to last? How have they impacted how you're thinking about your work? There's, there's, you know, there's, a, there's been a trend for the last eight years, sort of a, away from theaters, um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, to I, I will, I will name drop in a conversation with Marty Scorsese. He said, "Yeah, but when, when people first fell in love with movies, it was a Nickelodeon. You had to crank it like that." I'm sure everybody was a little bit nostalgic when suddenly you had to go sit down in a, with a lot of other people and watch a movie, you know, uh, and then it was and then it was sound and then it was color. And, uh, you know, and so I, you know, Brian and I go to various conferences, listen to people talk. We've never been the distributor. Uh, we've never been the exhibitor. Our job has always been the software. We're the storytellers. And so while as a directors and as an as an audience member. I love the big screen experience, 
but I've also watched TV all my life. Uh, and I'm guilty of being on a subway and watching something on my iPhone. I'm sorry, David Lynch and others. Uh, I, 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 I'm with you. It's not ideal, but I am, uh, I am guilty. I've done it. Uh, it's handy. Uh, so all I really care about is that people want to see these stories and there's a way to pay for them, to monetize it, and a way to reach audiences. Said, I don't think that the theatrical experience is going to disappear for all time. In fact, I kind of believe in, in my, I really believe that more, a wider variety of content may start finding its way onto big screens to create uh, communal opportunities around stories that people really want to share. So, you know, I think the division between what's a theatrical motion picture what's a what and what's a what's television or a streamer is uh kind of evaporating and for creatives i don't think that's a i don't think that's a bad thing story is king and um and audiences tell us you know when where how and why they want to watch our stories you know yeah. and and uh and if they want to watch them and um and and we're we're you know we're there to serve the audience at the end of the day yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting, you know, sentiment and not necessarily one I would always expect from a creative. Um, but I'm told that you enjoy screening multiple iterations of your own work uh, oh. with audiences in order to learn. And, and this is something that, you know, our host PNG is almost obsessed with, which they call consumer sure. insight. Um, I, how did you uh, how did you begin that? And, and tell us a little bit about how you learn from. <laughs> Okay. Well, enjoy is too kind of a word. It's an emotional <laughs> gauntlet. Uh, I mean, it, it's 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 like making the speech when you don't have any clothes on, you know, or whatever. And uh, you're, when you're supposed to be imagining the audience with no clothes on to give you confidence, you feel like you're the one with no clothes on, and 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 they're staring at you. So it's pretty unsettling. <laughs> Uh, uh, but it's very necessary. And uh, the very first time that I experienced it uh, was on the very first feature I directed for Roger Corman, low budget B movie, you know, mogul of all time. It was called Grand Theft Auto. I'll tell the story quickly. He said, uh, uh, we had the movie, it was, it was a black and white work print. There was no additional soundtrack beyond dialogue. We had no temp music. There was no budget for any of that. But he said, we, it's a comedy. We need to screen it for an audience. OK, so they 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 went down to the, it was a, this testing house in L.A. where they where they test programs, commercials and things like that. Usually they don't show movies. People sit with a dial. I don't know if they still have it. They must have some version of it. Uh, they turn the that. To right if it was funny and laugh, turn it down if they didn't like it or they were bored, so forth. So so we we show up to show Grand Theft Auto at, at the ASI at the house and um we look around, this is 1977. There, are, there literally are a, an entire auditorium full of blue haired ladies. Now this is a <laughs> raucous, kind of naughty, you know, ra uh, uh, car crash comedy. We looked at Roger and we said, what is this? And he says, well, uh, we're allowed to screen free on days when they're only showing commercials and the audience is a little frustrated. They don't get to see other kinds of content. So we're showing Grand Theft Auto today, and they happen to be testing Geritol. <laughs> uh, they were testing Geritol commercials on the day that I had to screen. Well, he said, it doesn't matter, laughs or laughs. And it was an important lesson, because while I, I'm not sure all the jokes landed on that particular audience, that you did see the dial go up and down in ways that when we tested later were in fact very predictable. So Roger knew a little something about that. In the years since, even as a final cut director, with with ultimate control over over you know what a, a movie or a TV show will be, I still depend on these screenings because I want to know what the story truly communicates to audiences. I made a personal decision to tell a story because of the thematics, because of the relate my relationship to the story or the characters or something, and that is personal. I make personal judgments all the way down the line, but ultimately I need to know. I want to know how the messages are connecting with the audience and if they are. And I'm always, always surprised. Now, sometimes I'm not willing to change it 
Sometimes I feel like it may frustrate some members of the audience, but it's it's central to the reason I made the project or what I believe the, the, the project's value is. Other times, you know, you really learn something that you're grateful to know now, you fix it, and you actually achieve more of what your initial goal was. So I, I'd say it's it is it's difficult, it's painful, but it's 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 so worth it to me. And I continue to 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 do it. Oh, well, that's, that's super interesting. Great story about Grand Theft Auto. I'm sure, you know, that film, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's a blockbuster video game by the same name. So, you know, we've got... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's been a um, mini clips a little bit. Yeah, uh, just a bit. But uh, I, I actually have never seen it. I'm going to take a note to, to see if I can find it. No. I, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Just think, think, good, <laughs> think good thoughts. I was 23 when I made that movie. We don't need to review it. <laughs> um, I, and, you know, I'm curious, not every successful filmmaker or actor makes a company, uh, you know, and, and Imagine has been around for, for some time now uh, and has been quite successful. What drove you to go beyond acting, beyond, you know, making films into making a company? And, and, and what have you learned from that process as opposed to just being an independent filmmaker? I, I've always been interested in independence, even though I work very closely within the system and always have, but I wanted to have as much independence as I could within that. And as I began to read about, you know, directors, producers, um, you know, through through, through the, 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 the history of the medium, you know, I'd see these that occasionally they develop these independent companies. And as I began to understand what that meant, it uh, I felt it would give me um, you know, a number of things. And, and I was right about this, more creative autonomy and control, um, more consistent set of collaborations, you know, a relationship with Brian Grazer and I 30 plus years, you know, we've been, we've been teamed together. And so have a lot of our, of, of our, you know, our executives uh, are, are long-term with us. Um, and, uh, um, and, and it's, uh, you know, the reason I became, wanted to become a director was to have as much control over the storytelling process as possible. So a production company is a natural extension of that. What's been great in this last few years as we've become more independent is that now, A, we've grown. So we have more, more collaborators, more great executives, but with focus on, on, on different narrative um, paths. We have a kids and family group that's growing like a weed. And, and these are exciting projects, projects that I might not have stopped everything and said, yes, I want to direct that or or put, you know, make that a, a priority focus. But now I don't have to. I can help. I can pitch in. I right. Can be the a company lets you scale. And Stephanie Sperber is running with it and making making exciting things uh, happen. Our documentary group is 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 growing in a spectacular way. There's a business that that uh, that Brian initiated uh, called Impact, which democratizes um, the development process for people who are not necessarily in the business. These are writers, content uh, providers who uh, have an opportunity to, uh, in a very disciplined way become a part of impact and develop projects put forward. We're having a lot of success. We're even beginning to export uh, impact to other countries. Uh, all of these things are thrilling to be around. And additionally, uh, you know, we have a, a brand group now that, that you know, is, 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 is really looking for these opportunities. So it's not right. just a matter of being opportunistic when Brian or I happens to yeah. get an idea or, or meet somebody like Mark, you know, we're really finding ways to um, to new ways and reasons to tell stories. Well, you you mentioned your documentary group. I know you you've you've come out with several. Um, you had World Central Kitchen, which focused on uh, Jose Andreas rebuilding paradise. Shooting, yeah, that's that one's just underway, and we haven't just even underway. quite begun. And then, delayed rebuilding bit, paradise is your most recent one, right? Yeah, that's about, um, about to be released. Yeah. Yeah, we'd love to show a trailer of that, but I think we're going to run out of time. So we can put that trailer into the platform so people can check it out. Uh, right. And very, uh, and very I want, personal to me. Yeah, and I'm from Northern California, so it's uh, oh. uh, personal for me, too. Um, and Hillbilly Elegy coming up for Netflix, uh, ne and that's exciting as well. And that's about really the uh, the area, you know, in the in the central of the central and the south of the country. 
Can you say a few yeah. words about that before we go? Sure. Absolutely. Well, yeah. What 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 attracted me to uh, to, to hillbilly elegy? I mean, first the book. You know, it certainly it certainly rang a bell. I didn't grow up in that region. Um, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. My parents are from the Midwest, rural, small town and farm uh, life. Uh, so lots and lots of relatives and and uh, you know the characters in the book. Uh, kind of rhymed and resonated with me. Uh, they sounded a, a, a lot uh, like like people that I knew, know, and love. But what I when I started talking to JD about what the movie version could be, what the adaptation could be, and started understanding his life, what I felt that was interesting about this was that it was both specific culturally, you know, and I worked hard for that authenticity and honesty, um, uh, warts and all. Um, and, and, but it's also what JD's journey is very universal across the human experience. And I found that even as we were making the movie, we would do a powerful dramatic scene, of, you know, in this family drama and you'd hear crew members from, you know, from all over the world talking about how much that resonated with them, how similar mm -hmm. that was to the experience. People from Brooklyn, people from San Francisco, you know, not, it's not just Heartland thematics, you know, right. uh, it's, and I, so I hope in a way that, um, it does resonate with people and it serves as, as a kind of a bridge. The other thing that I really loved about the story, the more, and it's in the book, you feel it in the book, but the more I spoke to JD about his particular remarkable journey, uh, our movie both, um, it dramatizes, um, and it celebrates the, the, the women in his life who actually made that journey possible. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I find that part of his story uh, interesting and moving um, and something that I was excited to also really focus on as a as a director. So as a family drama, which is the, the aspect of the story that I've brought to the screen, I think it's rich, interesting, entertaining, and it yields some great performance opportunities. Amy Adams, Glenn Close, they're just remarkable uh, in, in the movie. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Very short answer to a very short question from the audience. Do you miss acting? And will you ever go back? I would like to go back. I would like to go back. I love directing. So I, I, I miss it as a kind of a, as a fun thing. And I'm sure that I will, uh, you know, one of these days, maybe as my daughter Bryce's directing career evolves, maybe she's the one that could actually, uh, <laughs> you know, encourage me to set some time aside. I'd like to, I'd like to try it again, but I'm still loving filmmaking, directing and producing. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to you continuing that. Ron Howard, thank you so much for being part of Signal and we look forward to seeing your work evolve. So Pleasure. thank you again. It's going to be a great care. program. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.